25 years working in uh, investment management, uh, firstly for a firm called Jupiter Asset Management and Henderson Global Investors, mostly managing portfolios um, involved as an equity analyst. And through that time, I couldn't help but notice this strange paradox that more that people talked about the concern of climate change and the more people realised that this would present a challenge to the traditional oil and gas and coal industry, uh, the more the City of London and the more the globe's um, equity markets were financing uh, fossil fuel extraction. So, And it was just seemed a strange contradiction. And so I decided to... Um, do a back of the envelopes calculation just to look at the reserves of all the world's coal, oil and gas companies and to that's just the proven reserves and then to look at their future resources and actually try and estimate which direction we were going and in a nutshell what the markets are telling us is we're going somewhere north of 6 degrees of warming or the markets will get this wrong in which case uh, the contradiction will follow with, with, the, with these companies having to unravel their investment plans and so what my presentation is today is just a quick run-through. Now, there's lots of data that's going to be on that screen, and I know that we're not going to be able to see all the data on the screen, so I'm going to give you a gist. And I've got some handouts here which will give you the tables, um, but there aren't that many of them, so those are particularly keen to look at the detail of it. So uh, what I'll do is I'll then sort of run through the numbers, and then hopefully we'll open it up to a discussion. But um, an American called Bill McKibben from an organisation called 350.org and a woman called Naomi Klein who's going around doing a tour at the moment where she generously cites Carbon Tracker. Um, he read the publication. Now, I did this as a kind of a hobby and I recruited a young analyst to come in and do the, the detail and I thought that we would do, we'd print 200 copies and then we'd all go back to our day job and I'd satisfied my curiosity. But Bill picked, he managed to get hold of one of the 200 print copies and he wrote this extraordinary article in Rolling Stone magazine called Global Warming's Terrifying New Maths, um, or math being American. <laughs> and, uh, he, 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 and if you've not read it, it's the most extraordinary piece of writing, just as a standalone piece of writing. It became the most downloaded article on, on climate change off the internet, I think, ever, um, where he ran through the numbers. And then following that, he... Um, now, if any of you read the first report, I need to say this very clearly. What we didn't say was to divest from the fossil fuel industry. What we said is that we have a systems-wide problem, which, and the problem is with the, the way we regulate financial markets, it's the way uh, we direct markets, and the way actors such as asset managers, asset owners, pension funds direct their investment managers. So it's not a problem with the fossil fuel industry, it's a much broader problem than that, um, though we still have this, this contradiction. But nonetheless, Bill went off and said, OK, what we need to do is, is to get away from this concept of a bubble. Now, I want to also be clear, the bubble is not a financial bubble, it is a carbon bubble. There's more fossil fuels finance than we can burn to stay below two degrees. But it, um, it created all these campaigners with bubbles. So I just come back from New York, and the campaigners, I got sent this picture, um, and there were lots of campaigners, they kicked a huge carbon bubble down Wall Street, and it burst literally on the horns of the, <laughs> of the, of the bull in, in Wall Street. And, uh, and so really, the last the debate of the last year and a half has just been this non-stop series of headlines about universities and faith groups divesting, firstly from coal, but also the, from oil. And I was in the room when the Rockefellers announced that they were divesting from one car part of the Rockefeller family was divesting from the, from, from the coal and the oil and, and, and gas industry. And um, the, the, um, the debate, the discussion has really just kind of developed its own momentum. Um, so lots of news, lots of coverage. Um, and even today, just reading the, the papers today, I'm picking up... Uh, people reacting to the debate about divestment, but also reacting to the challenges faced by the fossil fuel industry. And this, again, looking at this paradox as to why, we, why is it every day um, markets are delivering tens of billions of dollars on a weekly basis to expand the fossil fuel industry? Why, why is that happening when we actually should be going off in the other direction? Um, so a glance at Carbon Tracker. Um, one of the things I decided to do is to, uh, is to recruit the people that know the oil and coal and gas industry sometimes better than the executives of the companies themselves, which is the Wall Streets and the City of London's oil and gas analysts. So um, the people that have come into my team have been people who've spent the last 20, 30 years 
on the other side of the table with management on a broad range of oil and gas companies. So if a coal company comes in, we're going to say, well, we're going to go and take a deep dive into the numbers, guys. And um, the chaps I work with put their hands up and say, yeah, we're going to go down there with you. And we're going to get into the detail of the numbers. So when we look at the oil and coal industry in particular and say it can't all be burnt, um, it isn't as simple as it isn't as simple as that. It's really it's a question of the economics. Some companies will win, some companies will lose, and the number work is really about working out winners and losers in a climate cons- carbon constrained world. So we produced these series of reports. The first one was "Is there a problem?" which is coined the phrase "the carbon bubble." The second looked at what we call stranded assets or unburnable reserves, wasted capital. This paradox of this. Well, let's get the real numbers out. The IEA says that to 2030. $23 trillion will go in expanding the fossil fuel industry, which is beginning to look like a large number. So what we wanted to do was really look at the annual capex, company by company, uh, oil field by oil field, um, mine by mine, and really get into the detail of that. And then follow that up with what we coined the phrase the carbon cost curve, which plots every oil project in the world against the cost curve and looked at costs of production, just to get into the numbers. So let's go to the carbon bubble concept. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the concept of the carbon budget. That's where we decided to to start, which is um, carbon dioxide, which about 43% of annual global emissions will come from the burning and combustion of fossil fuels, and particularly coal, and it stays in the atmosphere for 200 years, and they're the cumulative emissions since 1750, and obviously the last 100 years, the last 50 years, have been the most important, and since, since the agreement... In 1992, we've seen global emissions actually accelerate, not decelerate. And as it stays, as the carbon stays in the atmosphere, a concept of a budget, how much you can you continue to burn, how much can you release, knowing that the atmosphere, and we say the atmosphere, actually, what I probably really mean is the oceans, because if the oceans have been absorbing the carbon dioxide, uh, the atmosphere will observe the carbon dioxide when the oceans are full, which isn't a concept which sounds very scientific, but I think it's the simplest way of explaining it. Um, and that's when we'll probably see, and I say probably because there's huge uncertainty in all of this. I'm not a scientist. I started off as an economist. And we don't even... I mean, the economists don't understand the science. Well, actually, the scientists don't understand the economics. And uh, probably what we're trying to do at Carbon Track is bring those two disciplines together. So we have ranges of, prob- of probability of how much carbon dioxide principally can... We, and there are other global warming gases. Can we release uh, before we got ourselves into real problems? So let's start off on the right-hand side. Um, This word reserves, if any of you who've come from the fossil fuel industry know that the word reserves is very tricky, it has a very legal definition. And when we talk about reserves, when I say we, I mean citizens talk about reserves. What they mean is all that stuff underground. That's not the legal definition of reserve. What that is is resources, but the public wouldn't say resources. So just remind ourselves about definitions. But when we say reserves, what we mean is is all the identified fossil fuels, which is economically potentially economically recoverable, that could be burnt. It's not all fossil fuels are underground. It's not the methanes and hydrates are locked up in Siberia. It's pretty much it's not the 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 the, uh, the methane that's locked uh, under the oceans under high pressure. It's, uh, it's stuff which has been identified which, if you wanted to have a go, at, you could extract. And that's to around 2,800 gigatons of, of CO2. And then the IPCC um, gives ranges of probability of how much could you burn to stay within uh, two degrees of warming, whether you want a 60, 66% probability, 80% probability, or 50% probability. Um, we're taking 80% probability of avoiding 2 degrees, with the 2 degrees being what the scientists tell us is the upper limit, um, whilst pragmatists will say we're going to 3. Uh, 2 degrees is the upper limit. Um, and non-CO2 forcing is a curious phrase, but one you may be familiar with. It just refers to non-CO2 uh, global warming gases and the ability to restrain those. Principally, methane emissions could allow you a higher emissions of CO2. So we're looking at ranges of um, CO2 and probability. So this is, um, this is where the concept of the bubble com- comes from. I'll just explain what this, show, what this shows you. Um, having looked at company by company, look, looking at what they state their reserves are and what their resources are, there's 1,541 gigatons of embedded CO2 in the resources of the world's top 200 publicly traded coal, oil, and gas companies. The, um, the, the proven uh, 
reserves, i.e. the ones which are booked, which have got a 90% probability of recovery, is 762 gigatons. Um, now, your budget to two degrees varies. It's somewhere between 700 and 1,000 gigatons, um, depending on what assumptions you make. Now, we've allocated a share of the carbon budget. And um, why you have to do that is not all oil and gas and coal is owned by public corporations. It's owned by governments and it's owned by private citizens. And we've allocated a nominal share of that budget, 225 gigatons. And as you can see, that's the safe share. Uh, the green doesn't fit into the red, and that gives you your contradiction. That's, that's the problem that we have, is the green, um, or rather the red doesn't fit into the green. And there, there we have the central paradox, which is, is that the um, blue is, get, is expanding out to fit what we can identify, but we know it's way beyond the climate limits. So... Um, when you do it stock exchange by stock exchange, um, company by company, you can see markets at risk. And there's two critical, well, there's actually three critical markets, but I'm going to ignore Russia for the moment because it's kind of out on its own. There's two critical markets there. Um, one is New York um, and one is London. Um, if you're an investor, if you're a corporation, if you're a government, there's two markets with the problem. And, and actually, the next slide is far more important than this slide. It's where we're going to that's important, not where we are now. The blue is, is, is oil. Um, the lighter colour is the, is, is the gas. And the grey is coal. Uh, what actually happens is London becomes the world's financial centre for coal. Uh, in terms of what we understand, we've looked at the capex plans of all the coal companies. <coughs> and what happens in London is London bets the future on coal. becomes the coal centre of the world. Um, Shanghai and, and, and other markets, um, Johannesburg and, and Sydney, well, we would expect them because they're quite, fossil, they're quite resource dependent economies, particularly South Africa and Australia. But they really go, really go for coal. But London's the odd one. London is really going to be chucking much of the banking system and much of the equity markets, as given <coughs> Shell and BP and, and um, uh, Glencore are such big parts of the FTSE 100, the FTSE 50. Every, do every euro going in from an ordinary citizen's pension fund, 20% um, 20, 20 of that will probably go, probably 30% of that go, will go automatically into the fossil fuel sector as if, as if it has a rosy future because that's the other thing about markets is they don't always behave well. Of course we know they don't behave rationally. So that's what markets are doing. This slide here just sort of summarises it again. The, the 900, which is the carbon budget to two degrees, is, is in the green. Um, the three degrees budget is, is, is the 1,200, and total fossil fuel reserves is 2,680 gigatons. So, uh, and then the future total resources, everything that you can really go for. And that really is, again, just another way of demonstrating why we have a problem. Um, it, it is a fossil fuel industry problem. It's a banking problem. It's an equity market problem if you're an investor in these companies because you've got business models that don't work but you've got analysts, you've got regulators acting, you've got investment advisors acting as if um, uh, the future will just be a straightforward repeat of the past and that uh, this contradiction it isn't an issue for the strategies of these companies. And I think probably this is why Carbon Tracker is, has stirred things up a little bit because it just reveals what it what is. Um, yeah, that includes state-owned um, companies. In fact, that's, I'll come into that, the split, in, in a minute. So um, there are scenarios based. There's historical emissions. There's the, the pathways that we've got. We're currently, based on current emissions, we're on a pathway towards three uh, to five degrees of warming. But um, we need to stabilise. And, and I look at these scenarios because the IEA and the IPCC have different scenarios for projected uh, demand they've got well the key one is is well you've got the business as usual scenario which is the one that the oil companies default back to when they write to their shareholders about climate risk but we then have the new policies scenario which i think from the ia which is much more important which shows demand leveling out um and there i think you've got a regulatory issue for for people who regulate financial markets as to what guidance is given to companies and how they report on new types of risk so um, let's have a look at emissions trajectories. This is the um, IPCs in the blue line. You've got the IEA um, current policy scenario in the grey, which is the second line down. And then you've got the IEA 450 scenario, which is what, how demand uh, for fossil fuels will have to level out and emissions will have to level out 
to achieve a 450 parts per million or roughly a two degrees thereabouts of warming. And here's a timeline. Um, I like to work to timelines based on emissions. Um, and there's the critical timeline, 2031 to 2045, uh, when we actually go beyond, the emissions go beyond the chance of, of going back from two degrees or indeed three degrees. And 2031, if you're an actuary, uh, I like actuaries, are there any actuaries in the audience? No, you've got to spend more time with actuaries, guys and ladies, because actually the actuaries know a lot more about risk probability scenarios than traditional investors, because they're doing asset liability modelling. And the asset liability modelling tries to model somebody who's aged 20 today as to what assets you need to invest in for when they're 65 or 70 when they take retirement, or well, 70 now, that we can't retire at 60 anymore. Um, and they look at 50-year scenarios, and they look at the mix of investments you've got to own in your pension fund um, to secure a particular investment outcome. And when you look at 2031 to 2045, and we're in 2014, close to 2015, what we've got here is changes to the parameters uh, which look like the kinds of timelines that actuaries are happy with. And what we know from what... I'm, I'm, I'm happy with them because we did a presentation to the Institute of Actuaries where we had hundreds of actuaries come out who loved this stuff because, it, because people can start talking about 50 years, which is how actuaries like to work. Um, but companies don't like to work on 50-year basis. Governments certainly don't. Neither do investors. But when we start to look at that, those timelines suddenly become important because what we're doing is we're <coughs> investing to protect people's benefits, retirement benefits, whilst killing the planet at the same time. And that's the central, that's the central paradox, is we have this duty to maximise welfare to people that are members of pension schemes. But one thing we're not allowed to ask, if you're an investor, is what the world will look like in 20 years' time. Um, and actually, what types of investment decisions do we make that produce the outcomes that we want? And that's why I like those timelines. It tells us we have an immediate problem. Now, if you go into the investment planning horizons of large companies, and they have hundreds of people at Shell and BP that just do planning in the future and, and scenarios, which is, which is great, um, is investment plans where you, you're looking at 10 to 15, 20 years before projects come on stream, um, breaking through two degrees within that time um, period makes a lot of the investment planning, um, it renders it to a degree pointless. So uh, the numbers, um, Oxfam had produced today a very good report. When I say it's good, it's a, it's a, relatively speaking, a layman's introduction to the concept. And they use our numbers in it, where, where Oxfam explains some of these contradictions, is um, around... Uh, four trillion of equities represented by investments in the world's largest fossil fuel companies. Um, companies then pay, invest around 670, closer to 730 billion in capex. The figure is actually greater than that number because we're only looking at listed companies and in, to develop reserves. And in return, they, um, they give back to investors profits, which then get paid out to service debt and pay dividends. Um, and that's the cycle which people have been on for a long, long time. And that's the cycle which the incumbency represented by big coal and oil wishes to, to continue unchallenged. So um, the situation, we know financial markets can be structurally flawed and um, inadequate response to climate change is one of those failings. But the default assumption by every oil, coal and gas analyst is all that resources is out there to get hold of and it's all going to get burned. That's the default assumption of every sell-side oil and gas and mining analyst that I've met, it's the presumption, all the models assume um, the traditional IEA business as usual growth forever, and they assume um, that there's as much economically recoverable oil, sometimes at the same price that it is 20 years ago, though we know that's not true and people are beginning to realise that. And it's this default assumption that has to be challenged, um, because you cannot rely... Um, on that. And if they were to change their models, i.e. that we're going to decline and peak the demand for coal, then this would change the valuations for these coal and oil companies. Now, coal is already off, as we know, 70% of the listed coal companies. Have had That's the loss of value. Some of it is not as much as 90% of the loss of value of these coal companies. And oil's struggling as well. But it could, the path of, of business as usual could lead to what we call stranded assets, which is investing in an asset like a mine or an oil rig or a railroad that, fr that freights coal or oil that could be left um, economically unusable because the markets have changed. 
I'm going to move on from this to say, okay, well, let's accept that, but actually, um, the boards of the oil companies in particular are saying, it's not my oil that's going to get stranded, it's theirs. And everyone plays this game, it's not my um, investors are going to suffer, it's theirs. And, um, and this can only go on for, for so long. And so we thought, well, actually, what we have to do is it's going to be based on the economics. If you produce oil at $100 a barrel, and oil's at $80 a barrel now, and your production cost is, is $100, uh, then in, a de- markets, in declining markets, you're not going to win if all of your projects have a break-even price above a particular price. And the same with coal. So what, by using that, just a very simple observation, we can actually split oil, coal, and gas companies, including state-owned ones, into two groups. Those with um, cost of production above a particular price and those that will win because they've got very low cost of production. And who, who wins? Well, um, governments and companies where they own assets that cost, you know, a cost of production of $20 a barrel, for example, and just to pick that out, will win, and if you got it at $100. Now, the, the thing to be concerned about if you're an investor is it's the publicly traded corporations that seem to have most of the high cost projects. And governments have been very smart. They've been selling off the licenses for the high cost stuff to, to investors. And governments have been hanging on to the cheap and valuable stuff themselves for various reasons. So we partnered, I mentioned there are analysts. So working in the team, we have Barclays mining analysts. We have the ex head of HSBC's global oil practice. We have Deutsche Bank's and Citigroup's head of, ex head of research. And we developed a partnership with one of them to do a cost curve analysis. Um, so here are the takeaways, which are highlighted here. Um, we stress test CapEx against a notional carbon budget is really the key one there. And it's projects needing a break-even um, of $95 a barrel market price that are most vulnerable in a low-carbon demand scenario with governments moving towards uh, constraining uh, the sale or, or combustion of fossil fuels to two degrees. So um, we can split... There's a global supply, which is on the left, and then there's national companies, private companies, and then what we call the oil majors, which are the, you know, your Exxons, your BPs, your, your Shells. And what we find uh, on the right, as a, as a percentage share of, of total potential production, private companies, by which we mean publicly listed companies, have a, a very large share, but so do national oil companies. And um, a lot of those private companies, those listed companies, get left with... Um, potentially stranded assets. So this is what I mean by going into the detail, and I'll probably have to skip over it just to give the, the basics. But here's, here's just a classic break equilibrium, um, equilibrium economics where you have a supply of 360 gigatons, which is on the bottom, which is marked in the red, which is the available supply of oil to its share of the remaining carbon budget to two degrees. So of 900 gigatons of CO2, we just allocate 360 gigatons of CO2 to the oil industry and we've mapped we, we bought the Rystad Energy Database, we're an NGO funded by charities but we have, we've blown easily, we'll blow easily half a million on buying commercial databases um, and employing people to read the oil industry's databases and we've bought the Woodmap database as well to do coal and that wasn't cheap either, so we've had to look at 8,000 oil projects and hundreds of coal projects as well to map them against this cost curve. And you'll find a very high cluster of, of projects on the top right hand of, this, of the, the cost curve. They're the ones that are going to be in the problem. And obviously there are a lot of, of um, oil companies uh, in the bottom, right, uh, bottom left hand quadrant, which is, there's no such thing as a safe place if you're in the fossil fuel industry. But if you are, want to be, you're, if you're below that break even price um, of um, 75 to $80, that's where the carbon budget. So what we're saying is, is, um, is for markets to clear and not take us above two degrees, only companies and governments that own projects below the $75 to $80 a break-even price will win. And if you've got projects in your portfolio as a diversified oil company which, um, which are above that, then you've got a problem. And this is where you'll find the literature coming out every day in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, is what you're seeing there is most oil companies... With their, with their new portfolios going into tar sands, ultra deep oil are shifting way above that and there, there we have capital at risk, there we have the potential threat of um, stranded assets 
So what we did, then did is we broke it down into, on the left-hand side is cost of production, then we looked at conventional, and then Arctic, um, deep water conventional, then ultra deep water conventional, and then we looked at um, how much capital is going to be invested in projects of, um, based around different costs of production. And then we did the same for shale oil, um, extra heavy oil, and tight liquid. Um, and you're seeing how much capital is being expended. So capex by dollars, by break-even oil price, going out to 2050, um, how much of it requires a price above $150 a barrel to make money. Um, and there's that key number down there. Um, you've, um, you've got oil at $80 a barrel today. And just look at how much a future capex expects prices to be above that. So um, we then look at the provinces with the highest um, cost potential production. And then we go into it company by company. If you've got, download the whole report on our cost curves here. And as I said, the highlights are here. You can go much more into the numbers. And we do it company by company. So along the top, we've looked at conventionals, Arctic shale, extra heavy, tight liquids. We then look at their future capex, which is on the column on the right. So Petrobras will spend over $450 billion dollars. Um, out to 2025 on capex, and then we look at how much of that capex is at risk, which gives you, which is the next column on, on the far um, right-hand side, and then we look at it, which which sectors they're going going for. So um, quite a few are going for ultra deep water, um, a number obviously going for oil sands. So what we're trying to do here is let's assume you're a uh, buy side analyst, you work for Goldman Sachs Wealth Management. The way we want this tool to be used is to challenge the boards of companies on their capex strategies. Why are you deploying shareholder funds, um, and it's not in consequential amounts, on projects which don't recover the cost of capital and also have no place in the two degrees world? So what we're really doing is we're using classic financial arguments to challenge boards. And so we wrote to um, the top 15 of the world's largest oil companies and coal companies about their CapEx plans. And um, our, our allies in America filed shareholder resolutions against Exxon and BP. You probably, did you, have you seen the fame, infamous, shall I say? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Famous letters from Shell and, and Exxon and Total, where essentially they write to their to shareholders and say, we're going to burn it all. We're going to burn it all. And there, um, there we have, the, I think, the sober realisation of, of the direction these companies want to take the financial markets and their, their investors. And so we're sort of saying, well, actually, let's get into the detail a, li a little bit. So um, let's take a, uh, just a snapshot of what's happening. Um, and I don't think any of this is really new. The green, green line um, shows uh, the price of oil going up to 2013. We know that... Um, uh, oil has actually dropped down to 80, but when this was, was written, what this shows is return on capital employed. So really what should be happening is in a, in a period of high oil prices, the return on capital employed for a typical oil company should be going up. They should be making super profits. Actually what's been happening is the return on capital employed has been going down. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Mostly the cost of getting the stuff out is just has become astronomical. Cost of hiring rigs, engineers... Um, the steel work, the cement work involved, um, just, just make it uneconomic. Now with oil down, you've got a problem. There's a number of oil um, companies with a serious problem. Now here's one of the dirty little secrets of the global oil industry today. Um, every pension fund and charity that has the big oil in their portfolio says, "Well, we've got to keep it for the dividends. We've got to keep it for the dividends, guys." There's a strong reason. The dirty secret is that the oil industry has been funding its dividends out of um, bank borrowings, out of debt. It's not been funding it out of free cash flow and profits. It's been funding it out of debt. And the banks have been looking at this going, well, OK, we understand the oil industry. It's been around for you know, 80, 100 years. We, the past is always repeated in the future, as we know. Or do we? And so, of course, it's safe to continue to fund um, dividends using bank debt. And actually, I think there's a chicken coming, ready to come home to roost at some point. Um, so um, CapEx has been going up. So um, we know that the amount of money being invested to find more oil in difficult areas, and we know it's been getting more difficult as people go into the Arctic and so on, has been going up. That's the red line. But actually production's been going down in blue. Um, I don't think we have a supply-side problem. There's no shortage of fossil fuels. Uh, we, we have a demand problem. 
but actually the supply challenge is how is it possible to be to, to make um, investing in the sector economic when you've got production declining whilst capex is going up so this is um, th- three of the big ones Chevron Royal Dutch Shell and Exxon and again a very similar picture the orange shows capex going up and the blue shows production um, coming down or just steady. So we've got an industry that's facing some significant challenges. So let's get on to valuation. Um, Does it really matter? Does it really matter? And um, is it the case that these companies are overvalued? Is it the case that um, the fossil fuel sector, which will have to go through a rapid transition, is um, going to be... um, uh, facing its own crisis and a lot of it comes down to how you value and model the companies and what this tries to show you is what percentage this was by HSBC uh, what percentage of today's value of say Big Shell or, or Exxon is based around re- revenues going out five, five, five years or ten years and what they, what they discover is around 60% of the value of a company that's listed in this sector is made up out of um, revenues going out 10 years and beyond. So I, I use this slide to argue the case that actually whilst some would say that there is no real crisis in the industry, I would say that the transition to a low carbon economy, if we get this wrong and if we continue to head towards this 23 trillion of capex, which is what's forecast, then there's going to be potentially some significant valuation stress problems faced by the sector. So we've had this debate with the oil majors. So um, Exxon wrote their famous letter, 20-page letter. We responded with a 40-page response going through all their projects, pointing out where they were diluting shareholder funds and return on capital by deploying to to new investments. And then we did the same with Shell. So Shell tried to dismiss there's no carbon bubble, is what the chief executive of Shell has recently said. Um, And um, so we've responded with an in-depth analysis of all their key projects, all their key capex. You can download that off um, Carbon Tracker's website. Um, Shell haven't responded to our letter, um, but we know a bunch of shareholders have been in to see them to really quite challenge them uh, on this. Um, So the company's view of future energy demand is is they see fossil fuels will be two-thirds to three-quarters of all energy supplied in the next 30, 40 years. This is what Shell and Exxon have said, and because of that, we have no alternative um, but to supply energy. And they also um, conflate energy with oil as well, whereas I would probably say coal is a better representative for energy than, than oil, and they limit it to transportation fuels as well. So our view on it, that there will be slow growth in the Asian markets, particularly China. We're going to see a rapid transition because of transport efficiency, um, I think the projected take-up of electric cars has been underestimated. Um, air pollution controls is going to hit the fossil fuel industry, particularly coal, faster than anticipated. And subsidies. A lot of people attack the subsidies to the renewable energy industry, but the biggest subsidies, as we know, represented by hundreds of billions, is actually to subsidise coal, oil and gas. Um, and we see those subsidies going out in, in economies in, like Indonesia and in, in Egypt and Nigeria and so on. Um, and the rapid substitution towards solar um, and also um, the switch the, the, the switch trade between coal and gas is going to present a whole series of challenges. Okay, so I'm going to conclude with just one or two slides here. Um, what are we really trying to say here? What we're trying to say here is the fossil fuel industry has to go through rapid transition for us to have any chance of achieving two degrees targets. And that transition will have to start with the people that own those companies accepting the scale um, the speed of the transition. So who owns these companies? Well, not the boards of the companies. The companies are not owned by governments either. They're owned by ordinary citizens. And what we're seeing, even though I've not been a backer of the divestment movement, what we've seen is a huge mobilisation of citizens who, A, don't want to see their own funds invested in something that could potentially damage their children's future, um, but B, they're actually sort of saying this is a place to draw, to draw a line in the sand and that actually it's through the behaviour of private corporations Um, ones that they own through their pension funds that they feel that they can make an intervention, not through the ballot box. So our position here as Carbon Tracker is to supply companies and owners of companies with data and just to challenge the CapEx plans. Why deploy hundreds of billions in projects that don't make sense? Why have negative IRR um, um, projects, which is where where we've got to now, where there's no return to shareholders? 
Um, and start to engage with companies on projects where you've got, particularly old projects where they anticipate uh, above $95 break-even price. So this is a, a really an engagement strategy for, for owners. And I'm going to leave on this slide. I haven't tackled the coal industry. I could have done, but haven't done for time reasons. Um, there's a company called the Baldwin Steam Locomotive Company. It was one of the most important companies in the US uh, markets in the 1920s and 1930s. It was uh, a, a giant and they employed hundreds of people uh, researching more efficient steam engines. And they had research teams, and they said that steam was going to be the dominant form of transport well into the 1980s. And, of course, they hadn't understood um, that Ford and, G and um, General Motors were just around the corner to nick market share. And Kodak was the same. Kodak was investing in more efficient Kodak film. Uh, they hadn't seen digital and the same story across uh, history, whether it's Olivetti's um, or blockbuster videos um, competing against Netflix. And here's the question, you know, which is the next one? Which, which is the next sector? And I would, um, I would put it to you today that the, the next sector coming up is the one to go first is going to be coal. And, and oil is going to really struggle to make money in coming years uh, with changing markets. And all will also have to face um, an uncertain future.